Welcome to the UCLA Drive Time Podcast. My name is Dylan Stafford. I am your host today, and I am thrilled to be in the summer of, or almost in the summer of 2021, with our 2021 Summer Spotlight Series. And we have six members of the graduating class of 2021. Today, you're going to meet Ben Robner. He is one of the six nominated members of his class, uh, nominated by his class, who has a story that more than a few people thought the world should hear about. So uh, I'm really honored to get to spend some time with Ben. Uh, this is when I get my batteries recharged, honestly, listening to our students and about to be alumni um, on the court, doing the deal the last three years, uh, not enough sleep, not enough hours in the day, making big results professionally and personally. And I don't know if anybody is uh, a better example of that than Ben. He starts a new job um, in July. So a month and a half, two months from now, he graduates in June. So about a month from now. And five days ago, he became a father. He and his wife welcomed their very first child, beautiful baby daughter. So um, it's just my pleasure to say to the world, please meet Ben Robner, class of 2021. Ben, thank you for Thanks for saying yes to the nomination, especially, <laughs> especially at this moment in your life where you might be I am, sleep deprived. Yes, um, I am. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm honored to be nominated. Uh, yes, definitely a little sleep deprived. Uh, you know, the, the newborn baby uh, definitely takes uh, takes the, uh, the sleep away. Um, but all of my friends with babies tell me it's two weeks and then things start settling down. So. Uh, so we're, we're ready to go, but, uh, you know, she's a, she's an utter joy, uh, and absolutely thrilled to have her. Um, I have, you know, a, a picture, if you want to see Dylan, if I should well, pop it up. I think that would be the appropriate way to begin this conversation with the most important thing. First. Yeah, this is Isla Marie Rovner born on May 5th, 2021. Uh, here you can see me in my UCLA gear, gear of course, had to introduce her to, uh, her future school right away. Uh, and on the right, right is her swaddled up and napping. Um, so utterly thrilled to have her uh, and she is an utter joy. Oh, congratulations. And how's your wife doing? Thank you. Uh, how's doing your well. wife doing? Doing well. Uh, yeah. She's doing, yeah, she's doing really well. She's recovering nicely. Uh, definitely taking the brunt of the lack of sleep. Uh, you know, I wish I could, could uh, help, but then the natural need for the baby to be with the mom uh, is definitely uh hitting her harder than it hits me but she's doing very well and she is utterly and totally in love oh 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 well all health and oh just just all blessings on you and your wife as you begin your family and oh she's precious oh my gosh she's precious um thank you you know that's yeah. what all this stuff is in service of right you know it's like why do we even have all these big careers well to do stuff for other people and um Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Well, so um, <laughs> I hope you stay for the rest of the podcast because it may not get any better than a, a brand new baby girl. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna follow our normal format of of letting Ben um, introduce his story to you. You know who he was before Anderson, and then obviously here coming to the finish line, just a month in front of graduation. You know what happened during Anderson, and then the at the end, you know, kind of looking ahead. So what now? What where, where is he launching as he as he starts this next chapter personally, professionally? And um, we've got a couple of bonus questions at the end, so stay tuned for that. So um, I guess, you know, this is sort of your story, Ben. So uh, how, how shall we begin? Where would you like to take us first? Uh, I mean, I can, I can start with a brief background, kind of where I came from and uh, probably kind of the trajectory to decide to go to Anderson. Um, grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Yeah, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago uh, in a place called Naperville. Uh, it's one of the larger suburbs, so many people may have heard of it. Um, grew up with a stay-at-home mom and a lawyer father. Uh, I actually knew, didn't even really realize business was something that you could really go into. Of course, I know people start businesses and there's large businesses out there, but it, my family in no way, shape, or form kind of led myself or any my siblings, I have two older brothers, um, any of my siblings kind of down that path. Uh, as a matter of fact, for a very long time, I thought I was going to become a doctor uh, was my childhood obsession. Uh, up in, Yeah, up until I was in high school, actually. 
um, wow. and wow. made a, a pretty, yeah, made a pretty intense pivot to acting of all things. Um, I was a very, very gregarious child and I loved to be in the spotlight and the center of attention. Uh, and so I started acting um, from a young age and didn't really think it was a feasible career. So avoided it, but I had really supportive parent parents and they really supported me kind of pursuing that uh, path. And so I ultimately ended up deciding to go to a theater conservatory for undergrad, which is you know very unique to the uh, the MBA. Um, yeah, but many, it served me your, really well. Your, I wish we, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking over you. I, I, how many of your MBA peers studied acting? <laughs> Did you ever meet anybody who studied uh, acting in undergrad? I, really do not know a single one in my class. There might be one in the class below me, but I don't know if she studied acting or just pursued acting for a little bit after school. I don't know anyone that went to a conservatory. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry, um, I didn't mean to step on your uh, yeah. speaking. No, not at all. The conservatory uh, was... So I ended up... Oh, great. Sorry. Yeah, at, at DePaul, DePaul University in Chicago. Um, a phenomenal school, uh, really cutthroat. They actually have a cut system. I think they got rid of it. But when I was there, they uh, only 50 people got into the conservatory. After your first year, they cut four to they kick 14 people out of school. Yeah. So your second year, there's only 36 of us. And then your third year, they cut another 12. And so by your third year, there's only 24. So half of your class literally gets kicked out and told you're not oh. here anymore. Oh, yeah. You, you made it. Yeah. through. You made it through all that. I made it through. I made it through. Congratulations. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it teaches you, you know, in the business world too, people even say with like MBAs in the curve, uh, how difficult it is. It's like, imagine literally being kicked. There is a quota for people being kicked out. Um, it was pretty intense. My. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty harsh, but I guess, it, <laughs> I guess it, well, what, what would you say the benefit of it is? I mean, how did it shape you? Yeah. You know, in a lot of different ways. And, I, we can dive into this a little later if you want, but I had some trepidation about going to business school and having a very untraditional background uh, with my thought of all my classmates are being coming from finance or, you know, undergrad in business, et cetera, and I would be behind the curve. But one thing I realized pretty quickly is my uh, education in theater and in a conservatory really served me well where, in I would say three kind of main ways. One, the nature of kind of you need to be competitive, you have to want it or the person next to you is going to get it. And that's kind of the nature of the entertainment industry, and especially for acting. Like there's always someone that's hungry for it. So if you aren't hungry for it, you're probably not going to get it. And I think that translates to everything in life mm -hmm. um, and served me really well in business school. Uh, another thing is a big thing you're taught in conservatory is do not allow your walls to stop you from taking chances or putting yourself out there, right? Engage with the world, engage with people. And that, you know, is kind of will probably be like the running theme, I would say, of one of the reasons I found a lot of success in business school was my willingness to be the person that's like, I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to sign up for this and I'm going to meet as many people as I can. And I think a lot of that came from it's part of my personality, but I also think a lot of that came from my training in theater school because a big part of it is kind of tearing you down to build you back up to be this person that's really willing to engage with the world and the people around you to learn from them. Uh, and I think it helped me a lot. Oh, that's great. Well, okay. Well, maybe your, your story is going to inspire some of our non-traditional <laughs> majors. Yes, there's a place for everybody here. And, Agreed. You know, our attitude... I love cliches because they help when you're down. You know, our attitude determines our altitude. My father always tells me that one. Um, don't let what I can't control get in the way of what I can control. So, 100%. Um, I could not agree with that more. You know, there, there is so much we can't control. And uh, understanding that and accepting it is really, I think, vital to being able to kind of maximize your potential. Um, and, uh, you know, there are definitely challenges in business school. And uh, part of that is kind of the things that you can't control. And it definitely takes, there are moments that you have to accept those things in order to move past them. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So your, uh, your mom's at home, you got your brothers, 
Your dad's a lawyer, yeah. don't know about business, thinking about being a doctor. Instead, I'm going to go to this crazy cutthroat <laughs> conservatory. Okay, then what happened? So graduate from conservatory and always knew I wanted to go and go to Los Angeles to uh, go dive into film and TV. Um, moved out to Los Angeles right after graduation. Um, so I was like, here I go with one of my best friends. We had no money and he had a broken down car and we were just like, let's, let's do this. Um, and I have, I have a slide that I would like to show you guys. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty hilarious, but uh, had a modicum of success as an actor. Um, let me share this screen really quick. Uh, and although, uh, you know, I had a modicum of success, um, I definitely started feeling unfulfilled. Um, and sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm sorry. That was me. Just uh, you're, you're Mui, Mui Studley. And then the dog. I like. I like. Yeah. Yeah, the dog picture gets me every time. Um, but, you know, there as an actor, as fun as it is, there's also just a extreme lack of control that you really have over your career. Mm -hmm. um, and I am a relatively, I like to have control. I like to really be able to make my own path and destiny. And so I started feeling pretty unfulfilled and that led me into producing where I could kind of have a more holistic view of the whole project and kind of work with teams. And producing was really my first foray into like the closest thing to business that I ever experienced in my life um, and really loved it. I loved, you know, the collaborative nature of it. And I loved the puzzle that was like all the problems that came up every day and, you know, even loved like dealing with the budgets. And so through that, um, through producing, I realized there was a need in the industry for affordable pre-production space and uh, ended up um, starting a company with uh, one of my really good friends uh, to kind of fulfill that need. And he didn't have a business background. I didn't have a business background. Um, we had one other partner. She didn't have a business background and we just kind of went for it. And uh, easily growing and running that business was the most formidable learning experience of my adult life. Um, but it really, really taught me that business was this perfect uh, crossroads of creative, kind of that creative love that I have that comes to, that I got from acting but also that kind of control and the analysis and working with people and all of the things that I was really looking for, I found in running this company and it fell in love and uh, was a, a very long, intense path running Space Station. My friend, Dan, actually passed away uh, a year after uh, the company started in 2014. Uh, and that was really, really hard. We had raised a bunch of, we, were, we had raised money, we were raising more money, we had just expanded we were written up in the Los Angeles Business Journal, like things were going very, very well. Um, and he uh, had tragically passed. And it really, that moment was a moment of like, well, what do, what do I do now? And you come to those, I need to make a decision, right? I, need, I either can keep moving forward or I can take a step back. And we had already started building this thing and we had employees and investors, et cetera. And I knew Dan, it was important to Dan to move forward. so. Uh, did that and we started the scholarship fund in his name. Dan was always really passionate about giving back to the community. And so the way we felt we felt we could honor his um, passing was the scholarship fund. And so uh, formed and raised and formed this 501c3, the Danville Scholarship Fund, and raised um, money and had gallows, et cetera. And I ran that as well. And it was really the goal was to um, provide scholarships to young artists in LA and also mentors. So we would match them with people that can help them in their career. We'd give them money to get started, et cetera. Uh, and it was really you know, a, a wonderful experience and uh, it's something I'm really proud of. Um, and then finally, we had a third company called Thespis, which is really an online platform that tied into the physical location. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of rambling on if you have any questions before I... Well, where where did you get so space station casting studios? I, I love the name. What was the genesis of your name for your company? Yeah, so space station. It's a literally there. There's we had space physical space that we rented out to mm -hmm. for the entertainment industry. We mainly um, rented out for pre production studio space. So it was a lot of casting directors. So um, we worked from everything from 
student filmmakers all the way to Disney and Comedy Central and, you know, Lionsgate would use this sometimes. So we kind of ran the whole gambit. And um, the idea of the name was we're renting out space, space stations, like a funny name, and then casting studios, who's our main clientele, we're casting directors. Oh, that's great. So, okay. So, all right. I was thinking, you know, like a metaphor and I know Star Wars, but it's actually space station. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a lot more literal than people think. <laughs> uh, that's great. So, so, you know, and it's interesting, you know, you never, your, your dad wasn't really a business person. And yet when you're a lawyer, you know, there's, you know, you got partners and, you know, there's, it's, you're still your own boss at some level. So you come out here, not a lot of money, broken down car, got a buddy, you're getting traction, you have a partner pass tragically, but, but you, you did that, you were an entrepreneur successfully, that was where you were for a while, right? You did that for more than just a couple of years. Seven years. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, started 2013 and actually just left that, sold out my position in that company back in 2020. So a year ago. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a short time, but we really, you know, we grew, we expanded to us. We acquired a second type of a company of our type. So we were on the, we were in Hollywood and we acquired another company on the West side and, um, did a number of pivots. We you know, started even doing classes and there was just a lot. You know, my learning curve was gigantic because I knew very little about business. Um, and so there were a lot, of, there was a lot of stumbling along the way. Um, you know, it was trial by fire endlessly. We actually, I had, Dan and I would always say, bite off more than you can chew and chew it. And I actually had that printed out and put directly above my printer or my computer because the, the amount of times I was like, I don't know, like if we should, I, I don't know how to do this or if we can do it. And then it's just like, just bite off, bite it off and chew it. And, you know, with grit, you'll, you'll get there. And, uh, it, it, it worked out. It was, uh, intense, sometimes very trying road, but uh, a truly phenomenal learning experience. Well, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I went back, I can cheat, right? I went back and looked up your, your Super Saturday admission interview. And uh, I think your first reader was Raymond. And we liked your story when you uh -huh. applied um, because we thought you were going to have a lot of, I learned it the hard way, that you would bring in with you and you know part of what we're always ever trying to do when we build a class is think about well what are they going to talk about if we get this group of people together you know who's going to learn from whom and 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 who's going you know what nobody's a star in everything but everybody should be a star in at least one thing and so you know i, I just i was cheating this morning getting ready and reading back and um you know your your sort of long-term entrepreneurial success in your major, you know, like you actually were. So again, maybe that's that cutthroat preparation gave you enough of the thick skin to be an entrepreneur, you know, and deal with. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think I would completely agree that I think that kind of as an actor and through the conservatory, you have to accept failure and knows constantly. I mean, as an actor, you're going on when you're in your prime, 10 auditions a week and you're getting no's on 10 of those auditions. And so it's just this acceptance that a no doesn't mean I'm the worst or it's over. A no, it's just like, all right, that's a no. Let's move on and try to get that yes. And that's a huge part of entrepreneurship, right? You get an endless amount of no's. You get an endless amount of that's a bad idea or why are you doing it this way? And you have to learn, you know, take advice and learn from people, but it's also vitally important to understand your self-worth and have your, enough confidence to say, I'm going to keep moving forward. I, I trust myself and I believe in myself and I'm not going to really fall. Uh, something I preach all the time to people, which is resilience, which I truly think is one of the most vital traits to be successful is just be resilient, be able to bounce back. You know, I had some rough uh, recruiting experiences even at Anderson and it was, uh, really hard. And you know, my wife and I, you know, I, I was pretty beat up about it, but it's just like be, be beat up for a bit and then get back up and get back out there because otherwise, how are you going to move forward? Yeah. 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 You know, our attitude is determining our altitude and yeah. 
Yeah, business school yeah. for me was humbling. I had 36 no's before I got to my one yes. <laughs> and uh, I had my winter quarter of second year as a full-time student going, what am I doing wrong? And, you know, and it was, <laughs> I actually relaxed. Spring quarter, I said, ah, the heck with it. I got the rest of my life to get a job. And I did the school talent show. So my little thespian came out and I won second place. I, I, did, I got the dean of the Chicago School of Business on stage. He was the straight man. And I was Ross Perot and I wanted to buy the whole school. How much? I'm going to call this the H. Ross Perot Graduate School of Business. <laughs> so um, it was a little, it was a little second city, Chicago, <laughs> South Side stuff going on there. So, you know, resilient. I love it. Well, well, in all of this, Ben, when is when is the MBA seed planted or did it come from a mentor? You said you liked the problem solving of producing, but you know, MBA yeah. is a big chunk of money, big chunk of effort. How did how did you get to Anderson? Yeah, yeah so um back, let's see, I applied in 20. 18 is when I think I sent in my application. So in 2017, um, I was in the process of starting. I was like, I have this new company idea. I want to start a new company um, that once again was in the entertainment industry. And I started reaching out to old investors and people I knew with money and started realizing that, yes, I was self-taught. Yes, I have this business that's been successful to a, to a degree. Um, but I still, Felt like there was this kind of barrier of knowledge that I was running into. Okay. And you know, there's only so much I can Google to learn. And additionally, I uh, additionally I you know had my a girlfriend at the time who would become my fiance and then my wife. And we were uh, talking about marriage and I knew that I wanted to really be able to lay a foundation for my future and my family's future. Um, that I didn't really feel that my theater conservatory undergrad, and then this kind of entrepreneurial track that I'd gone on to, which was wonderful, really uh, allowed me the stability that I wanted in order to feel comfortable starting a family. Okay. And so that really, those kind of two things, this talking to investors and realizing I still feel a little like I'm behind the, the behind the, the knowledge curve of in specific specifically around finance. Like that was a huge thing. I was like, I don't know how to do any of this. Um, and then additionally is like the stability of an MBA um, and kind of what that offers. Uh, and so had a conversation with my girlfriend at the time, now wife uh, about kind of the picture I had for this and like the future. And yes, it's a huge amount of money and um, it, it's kind of intimidating to take on, but I really believed that it was the right move and kind of with my experience and where I wanted to go, it would pay off. Um, and I am beyond happy. I honestly, what I always say to people is I just wish I had done it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> There's my sound bite. Okay. We'll put that on the, put that on the headline <laughs> of the whole podcast. Well, um, anything else about, you know, your, your journey before, before business school, any mentors or anybody else who was kind of, helping you chart your path. I, I get the, I mean, yeah. you. it's so cool to hear you, you know, you were doing business and you were realizing, wow, financial deals and term sheets, and there's a language to all that. And I'm, I'm Googling in the lobby yeah. while I wait to go ask for money. And maybe that's, maybe that's not the best practice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely had a mentor. He actually, um, wrote one of my, um, uh, recommendation letters for my application to Anderson. A uh, guy that I met in Chicago, phenomenal, um, phenomenal man, guy named Jody Casola. He a uh, pretty successful real estate investor in Chicago mm -hmm. and um, met him when I was going in my undergrad uh, and just became a lifelong friend. And he, a lifelong friend and uh, investor. Uh, and so through kind of his uh, mentorship, and he was actually the one that I had reached out to about this new business idea. He was uh, completely in support of me going to business school, and uh, even like running Space Station, the amount of times that he and he was basically on speed dial of like, Joe, I don't like, how do I handle this? Like, what do I do, or what does this mean? Um, and was just a truly really, not only just a phenomenal, wonderful, giving, kind person, but just super knowledgeable and a great resource for uh, myself and my company uh, and 
he was really kind of the main, um, the main mentor. Additionally, my uh, deceased business partner's brother uh, has become a very successful mentor. I mean, mentor, um, entrepreneur. Uh, he started his, uh, his own company out of college uh, and he has done very, very well. And so we also used him and he's still a very close friend of mine um, to, uh, you know, bounce ideas off of. And also like, how do we do deal with investors and term sheets, et cetera, because he dealt with all of that. Nice. All right. Well then, and now we get to enter the picture and we get to start to benefit from you joining, joining the UCLA family. So, um, you want to kind of get into some of the, I mean, it's, it's not quite done yet. You're in your final, no. final stretch, but you know, so what happened here? How did it go for you? Yeah, um, I'll start and just say it went phenomenally. I mean, it, it truly was a an amazing experience. It, I learned more in a compact time than I possibly could have imagined. I created everlasting friends, some amazing mentors, and just had phenomenal experiences. And also, and we'll get into it. You know, now have a, a career I'm very excited about pursuing after school. Um, as I mentioned before, I was definitely, I'm not really the type of person that tends to have any imposter syndrome. I tend to try to push that away. Uh, as we kind of talked about before, I think that's more of a hindrance than anything. And so I just say like, that's not me. But that being said, going into business school, as I mentioned, I definitely was uh, intimidated and felt that I would be behind the curve um, based on my lack of really, you know, in undergrad, the only class I, the only classes I, I didn't even take a math class. So the last time I had taken any math class was in high school. Um, and, you know, took one sociology classes, you know, it, I was just in no way, shape or form ready. I, in my mind for business school, um, uh, took a bunch of classes online before going into school, thinking it would help. Um, but one of the things that I really was, and I, Please, anyone that's listening to this that has an untraditional background, take this to heart. I, in no way, shape, or form, did I ever really feel drastically behind the curve. I, I didn't. I didn't feel like I had a ton of catching up to do. Yes, in stats, I struggled probably a lot more than some of my friends that came from more, you know, engineering backgrounds. And yes, in right. finance, I had to probably work harder than some of my classmates that came from finance, but. I never, yes, it was hard work, but I never really felt like I can't do this or this isn't something for me. And you know, a big part of Anderson, and I really believe this is sharing success. And when I struggled with something, there were there was always a classmate willing to help me. I just had to reach out. You know, I always remember Dylan, you have that story that you told during um, I believe it was LF, uh, when you were getting your MBA about I forget her name, but like finding your person that can really help you through the classes that you struggle with. And that's, it's so true. Yeah. And you build a camaraderie there and there's always something you can give too, right? There's, it's, it's a two way street. And as long as that's there, um, you can get through it. And so truly, if you come from an untraditional background, if you were an actor for the last 10 years and decide you want to get your MBA, it's doable. Um, and it's not only doable, but you can excel and do really well. Uh, and I believe it. Um, so let's see, I've got, I got a little off track. So I jumped into business school. I jumped into business school and I jumped in, you know, in the deep end. I was like, I'm going to sign up for everything. I'm going to engage. As I mentioned before, like engaging is, I think the most important part. I think one of the reasons I got so much out of Anderson was I tried to, anytime I had availability, I would go to something, right? Even if I was exhausted, like this, is, you're paying for this. You want to get as much out of it as you can. Go and network, meet people, learn, go to events, go to go to speaker series. There's so much that Anderson offers; it's almost overwhelming. Um, but especially coming from a background where I had very little knowledge of the rest of the of any industry outside of entertainment, I was curious, and so I would sign up for, you know, finance seminars and uh, econ seminars and. CPG, anything, right? Anything that was out of my wheelhouse, I would go to and learn about. And I loved it. And I think that served me really well in school as well. Um, and the last thing is, maybe I do this too much, some of my classmates might say, but raise your hand, like, and engage with it, like, get in class, be the person that 
want, is curious and it starts a conversation and engages with the professor, uh, not only do you end up getting good relationships with, with your professors who can be phenomenal resources, I have some great, uh, some professors that have become really great mentors to, for me, um, but you learn, I, I believe I learned a lot more because I was willing to kind of put myself out there and ask questions and be like, yeah, I don't know the answer to this is, but I'm going to try and go for it. Uh, and I think you're, it also creates a um, environment in your class that other people feel comfortable doing that too, right? So like be that, be that person that's going to throw up their hand and maybe say the wrong answer, um, but uh, it at least engages with the class and the material. Um, and I, I have loved it. It's been, it's been phenomenal. Um, how about, so how about, I, I signed know, up for multi, sorry, go for it. No, I was just going to, you know, I'm thinking, cause you know, our, our class of 2024, um, we record these spotlights for everybody, but specifically to welcome and greet our class of 2024. So if they're listening to Ben and he, Ben's, wow, his life is cooking. Wow. Look at all this good result. I want to be like Ben when I grow up three years from now, two and a half years from now, like what, what did involvement look like even fall quarter of year one? You were in section four, right? You did Tuesday, Thursday? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, so involvement- what, what did you join first? And you know, what did it look like yeah. at the start? So uh, right off the bat, I, I made the conscious decision and I'm not saying this is what you should do. I made the conscious decision to, to only join professional clubs. I didn't join any social clubs. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah. Mainly I did that because I was like, I'll just go to happy hours and meet a lot of people and then <laughs> spend spend the actual, the other time uh, that I have going to kind of the uh, professional clubs. But I joined Entrepreneur Association, Entertainment Management, uh, and uh, I applied to uh, be the uh, external affairs um, director, or I forget what the, the exact title is, student rep, that's it, for my section, so for FEMBA Council. Uh, and those are like the three things that I did that I was like, I'm going to do these three things and I'm going to really involve myself in them. And then moving forward, I'll see kind of how I want to index more on something or reduce kind of my, my commitment to things. Um, so right off the bat, joined EA and uh, pretty early on realized there was a need for a new program, which we can get into and pitched a whole new program and became a, a VP, got a VP position for that from the Entrepreneur Association. And then was elected by my classmates to be our external rep uh, my first year in council, uh, which council and what we can dive into this in a little bit, but was just a really phenomenal experience. Um, the access you get to admin and faculty and just the bonds you create with the other classmates in council uh, is worth it. I, if you, I would say most people should be able to find the time. Fembas have you know crazy schedules, everyone does. Uh, so definitely I think Council is one of the key ways to get involved. Uh, and no joke, my best friends coming out of business school are from, were, were served on council with me. Uh, and so those are kind of the, the ways I got involved. Additionally, just going to literally every, my wife would make fun of me and be like, you're really going to happy hour again? And I was like, I have to, I have, it's, it's networking. Um, <laughs> so, you know, getting going out there and meeting all your classmates. Everyone is from such unique backgrounds and it's such interesting stories, you learn a lot engaging with them. And uh, it, it helps a lot, you know, because then once you find out that person X is great in finance and you're not, you know who to call. <laughs> so, and and the, you were married before, because you said it was you, your girlfriend, fiance, and now wife. When did you, were you married before FEMBA or during? Yeah, so we got engaged um, before, we, before I got accepted to business school. What's funny is I told my wife, who is an architect, uh, hey, I'm uh, my girlfriend at the time. I, I'm really thinking of going to business school. And she was like, oh, okay, yeah, we talked about it. And next thing I know, she's like, I think I'm gonna go get my PhD, applies to UCLA to get her PhD, gets into UCLA before I even get an acceptance letter from business school. And she, I was like, wow, you did that so much faster than I did. Uh, and so we, yeah. Hilarious. Um, so we ended up starting at UCLA at the same time. We were already engaged by the time we were going to start. And so we decided to do a courthouse wedding the summer before starting school. And then we had our actual full wedding the following summer. Um, we just felt like for taxes and health insurance, et cetera, it'd be easier to just get married 
get that off the table and then have just a big celebration uh, going into my second year. Oh my, wow. Okay, so you were, your life was exploding when you walked in the door and now it's exploding as you get ready to graduate. Okay, I'm noticing a yeah, theme I have a, I'm noticing a trend. I, 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 have a, I have a really, one of my best friends in the world that always makes jokes that like, if my wife and I are very similar in this way, it's like when the Rovners do it, they do it as hard as you possibly can. It's like, we're just gonna quit everything. She was working at an architect firm and she's like, we both quit our, you know, I stayed working at my firm for uh, two years, but she quit her job and went get her PhD. And we were like, we're just gonna, we're gonna go for it. Wow, uh, and what, what's been, her field? The right move. What is, is her field architecture? Uh, or architecture? Yeah, architecture history. So Ooh. she um, really dives into, and she really focuses on Los Angeles area too. So it's fascinating. You, she can tell you so much information about LA area that you never knew that is unbelievable. Um, she's a pretty, fun, all while now having a baby and working on her dissertation. So anytime I say I'm tired, I have, I, I can't, I have no excuses. Oh my God, you guys are, what a couple, what a couple. Okay. All right. Okay. So, you know, and, and again, just trying to be in the shoes of a, of a new member of the class of 2024. So going yeah. all in three clubs is a lot, you know, cause you, you're, you're a FEMBA, you're fully employed. You've, you've got, you know, you've got friends and family, you've got a career. And, you know, I always think the best metaphor for FEMBA is it's not part-time MBA. That's the wrong. It's, it's a moonlighting MBA. You know, this is like, if I'm going to go yeah. and take I'm going to go get another job that's half as much as the job I already have. That's, you know, FEMBA kind of takes away all those little pockets of Game of Thrones and, Free time. and you know. <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, very much. I mean, that's the huge thing. You when you when you decide to go down this path, part of the decision is like, what can I cut out of my life in order to fit this in? Um and a part of that is free time. And honestly, I think part of it is to some of my very good friends outside of uh, FEMBA, to their dismay, like some of my social life kind of went on a back burner. Well, I, I maintained it, of course, and they're all very happy, but there's only so much time in the day um, and you kind of have to figure out how to juggle it. But I will say, and I think this is important to say, I was fortunate, a lot more fortunate than a lot of my classmates where my company was functioning in a way that I didn't necessarily, not even necessarily, I didn't need to be there all the time. So as long as I really had my phone by me and could answer emails and calls, like I had to tell professors sometimes like, hey, if I have to run out of the class, there's you know a meltdown happening in my company right now, I may get a phone call. And that happened a few times and professors are always really wonderful about it. Um, but because I had that flexibility that you know often traditional jobs don't allow, I was able to engage with Anderson and even more like, you know, I would, I would go to things at 7 a.m. or 8, there's nothing at 7 a.m. I don't know why I said that at 11 a.m. <laughs> on a, on a Wednesday. Um, right. So I think that it's worth saying that, that I kind of had the, the luxury of having a very flexible schedule. So I could go, I could engage even more than probably the traditional student does. Well, and yeah, and, and you, you were living in LA County. So, you know, a third of our students yeah, live outside. Very close, yeah, yeah, very close to campus too. So I think that's all worth saying. That being said, Bemba does, there are, Anderson offers a phenomenal amount of things in evening and there there is no shortage of opportunity um, to fit into your schedule. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's something for everyone. Well, and, and how about, again, this is, you know, I mean, but for our entering students, of course, you know, they're kind of where my focus is, but, but for all of us, because we're all learning how to participate, you know, let's all be CEO of our own life. I love that metaphor, because what does a CEO have? A CEO has a strategic responsibility plus tactical execution, puts together a board of advisors. Yeah, you mentioned Monica Ritchie got me through stats, Kim Arnold got me through <laughs> accounting. You know, those are, those are real, real human beings. I still keep up with Kim, I've lost touch with Monica. Oh yeah, but you know, as how, so so for our new students, how about the friend thing? Like, how did you know you you alluded to your your kind of pre MBA circle of friends? Your your fiance is becoming your wife between you know first summer and second summer. Like, did did you try to did you try to overlap? my pre-MBA friend circle with my new MBA friend circle? Like, does your wife know a lot of your friends? Like, 
What did it look like? Because I think that's where I hear people create synergies is I don't have a time to be the friend I used to be 100 percent. You know, so I'm going to like I mean, well, how did you do it? Let me not try to lead the witness. <laughs> Your dad's. Yeah, no, you I mean, <laughs> yeah, let, me, let me call my dad on you, Dylan. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, I think creating synergies is in a in, in business speak. We can say that it, that is what we did. You know, even when we got married going into second year, um, there were some of my classmates, MBA classmates came to the wedding and all of my pre MBA friends were there as well. And so, you know, there are definitely, uh, I have close pre MBA friends that now are acquaintances and some, and for some of them, even friends with my MBA friends. Uh, so that world very is definitely mixable. Of course, you're right. you tend to be drawn to your friends tend to be friends with your other friends. Uh, if you, if that's how your circles work. And, um, I will say kind of along the lines of what you were saying, kind of create your board of directors or advisors in life. Uh, I, I completely agree with that as well. Uh, you know, I, some of my best friends, one of the, at, from business school, one of the reasons that I think we kind of went down that path is we each saw strengths and weaknesses in each other that could help, um, fill gaps that we were maybe missing in classes or in projects that we wanted to do together, or even BCO. These, a lot of them are on, were on my BCO team. Um, and that kind of filling those gaps end up turning into very strong, really, really wonderful friendships um, that I am positive will last, you know, far, far past uh, business school. Um, but to, to your point, yes, I, I definitely think there's opportunity to mix and mingle all of, you know, all of your friends. Um, we've, we've done it plenty. <laughs> and I, that's a beautiful testament, just that, you know, cause you're, you had your courthouse wedding the summer before school started. And then you had your your more social wedding the summer after your first year. And so after three quarters of business school, there were people that you were willing to share your wedding with. You know, that's. Yeah, it, it, I mean, because I, I think sometimes people don't really think I'm serious when I say, you know, these handshakes to hugs. Right. It's a handshake on the first day of leadership foundations. But when we get to commencement, you know, it's hugging and crying. It, it really it totally it's, it's not, I, I think people have stereotypes about business, business is calculating and methodical and, you know, set personality to the side. And not everyone has that, but some people have that possible perception. And, and that's not been my experience. Businesses are made up of human beings and yeah, they're, they're making big decisions yeah. that have big impact and, you know, are serious and have import but they're still human beings on the other side of that table. And, and you know, I love Professor Foster who used to run um, the Global Access Program for so many years, you know, said, because he was a president with Xerox and, you know, three things you're always asking over and over and over, who are you, where are you going and can I trust you? And he said, you know, that's basically that, you know, do that for 40 years and you just had a career, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's totally true. I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you put it perfectly. It's the, the fact that my wife and I were not only willing, but wanted some of my cohort after three quarters to be at our wedding really says how close quickly you become with, with some of your cohort and uh, for, you know, us ma maintain those relationships for long-term. Where'd you get married? Oh, I'm just curious. Where was your wedding? No, you're fine. So we, our wedding was at, we actually did almost an entire DIY wedding. Um, my wife being an architect is very, very good with uh, all of these things. And we were fortunate enough as well to, I, we have um, close friends that have a very, very lovely home and they gave us, not gave us, but they allowed us to use their house and very lovely backyard uh, to have our wedding. So it was good. We actually used UCLA music school undergrads for our band. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the music school. I went to the music school and I asked them and they're like, you can post it. And we had that, we had a bunch of undergrad sent bands send us their music and we picked one and we paid them and they were our, they were our live band for our wedding. It was great. It was phenomenal. Oh, wow. What kind of music did you, were they eclectic or did they have a, a genre they liked? They, I mean, it was like kind of quintessential. It wasn't like stereotypical kind of whatever the, 
Rooster Dance, I forget what it's called. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, like your, your standard, your standard wedding songs that people all dance to. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, so you got well, married yeah. out here, not, My, not back, not back in Naperville? Yeah, no. So I've been in LA now for, man, 13 years. So, you know, my entire, my entire life, my, my family is, you know, all of my friends and my family came out here and my wife's family, my wife's from, uh, uh, the Los Simi Sam Valley, the Los Angeles area. So, oh, uh, we, cool. we okay. kept it out here. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. My wife just yelled from the other room jazz. So yes, there was a lot of jazz in our, uh, we uh, jazz was one of the big, big parts of uh, the music. Oh, that's awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. My wife love, uh, my wife worked so hard on our wedding without an architecture PhD. Um, so I can't imagine. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Totally. And I'm awful with that stuff. Like that is one thing I am not good at is kind of crafts and, and all of, you know, interior design is not something I'm good at. And so she really, it was a lot of her designing everything and then just telling me where to put things and what to do. <laughs> I'm going to wear a tuxedo and I'm going to stand on the little X of tape. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was, I kind of felt like, woo. Yeah. My wife, my wife from New Jersey, <laughs> we got married in Rhode Island because she went to school in Rhode Island at this mansion on the water. And I'm from Texas. And <laughs> I was like, okay, this is, this is great. I love it. It's, it's <laughs> awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. Say yes and try to try to carry your own water and hang in there. <laughs> exactly, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, what what else happened during school? Did you? Yeah. Uh, you, so you did a conversion, um, right? Or well, or what would you like to talk about next during during your school? I, I appreciate you really kind of pulling out the the extracurricular involvement, pulling out the the transition of of pre MBA social network blending and, and integrating and becoming a bigger during MBA social network. Um, what else, what else could we talk yeah. about? So we can kind of, I'll, I'll briefly, I have just a few more, few more slides we can kind of show and I can talk through those experiences. So one thing I know, I know you want, you would love this. So one thing I just wanted to say is I absolutely loved leadership foundation. We had this rope course, uh, and some hilarious stories happened from here. You know, you really do this, this, that week is a big bonding week with a lot of your section. Um, there was a great story of on the, those beams on the right. I couldn't find, pic there's a picture of uh, this, one of my friends, Christian and I, we were up on this beam and we were doing our, you have to cross each other and he was falling and he, I grabbed him and there's this hilarious picture of him falling and me holding him up. And I ended up pulling him back up to the beam and we finished it without falling. Uh, and it I feel like it's really a, you know, um, a metaphor for a lot of what happens in business school, um, where, you know, you're, you, maybe you're falling in a class or something and a, a classmate will help you, will help pull you back up. Um, but all in all the, you know, this leadership foundation is all about team building and being a leader. And it really, really, truly was, uh, one of the, the coolest ways to kind of kick off school and, uh, create a lot of great friendships. Um. I'll dive into so student council. We briefly talked about my first year. I was a uh, student rep and my second year. I was the VP of alumni affairs. Uh, and one of the really cool things about being a VP in FEMBA council is you not only get an app, the opportunity to really interact closely with admin and faculty, but you really get very close to the rest of your council. Um, you know, you kind of see all of these pictures of us and we genuinely had a wonderful time together every time we would do anything. It was just fun and laughter and uh, just great friends. And the, one of the coolest things is you really do have the opportunity to enact change and the admin and faculty are supportive of council doing that. And so it's not one of those things that you feel like you're just doing for the fun of it or you're doing because it looks good on a resume. You actually really feel like you, the things that the council comes up with and works with faculty and admin on get integrated into school and you have an, a lasting effect on Anderson. And I, I have a lot of pride in that. And I think it's been, it's been really rewarding. Um, so on top of just the friendships, kind of that opportunity is, is really great. Uh, this up here, Dylan was, is the, the, the uh, I believe homecoming game. 
um, our second year, uh, which is really great. This is our, our council pick, which is a little different than the picks in the past, but I feel like it it reflected our our um, our, our council uh, team well. Um, yeah, and you guys, oh, just between your your 2021 leadership cadre and and the 2020 with the wrong and and that crew. Um, I mean, you guys really, it was neat how your classes both bonded and, um, and I mean, you were both going through COVID last year into this year and yeah, yeah, this is just so many, I mean, like here's basically, I see everybody except Derek and Maxine. So um, of the summer spotlight series, you know, here we are, here, there's Megan, <laughs> and there's you and there's James and yeah. Uh, yeah. In a room. Oh, yeah. so, so there's four of the six in that picture, plus some of our interviews from last year with the wrong and, and Darcy and everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I think it kind of kid continues along that path of like engage. And one of the big things is if you're on, you know, the board and council, you're probably inherently someone that really wants to engage with the school. Um, and uh, it's uh, truly really was a wonderful experience. So highly, highly recommend getting involved in council. Um, and, and fingers, fingers crossed on the Rose Bowl. We're going to try to go to LSU. Uh, I mean, you know, COVID, LA County rules, but the Rose Bowl wants to sell tickets. We have first dibs on, on that real estate because they love us now because we've gone to Oklahoma and Cincinnati and Texas A&M. We're, yeah. we're, we're their like prime candidate. They want a lot more of what we've been doing with our big Rose Bowl events. So we've had the That's initial awesome. meetings and, um, you know, fingers crossed that we're going to pull it off. Uh, we can only hope that'll be really amazing. Uh, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I think people are so ready. Let's just uh, come on. Let's have totally. some normalcy, please. Totally. Uh, so then another thing I wanted to bring up, and you mentioned this, was I was fortunate enough to go on a global immersion before the pandemic hit, which canceled all of them. Um, went to Finland and Sweden. You can actually see my wife joined us. Uh, you can see her right there. Um, and this was another amazing experience. We spent, uh, I think the total trip is five days. Um, my wife and I actually bookend, bookended the trip uh, at the beginning and the end. Uh, and so spent about two weeks in Scandinavia. Uh, but if you have an opportunity to go on a global immersion, I'm assuming they'll be back by then, uh, assuming travel opens up. Uh, truly one of those unique experiences that Anderson offers that not only do once again, you create these really great friendships with the people that are traveling with you, you get to experience different cultures and also the companies and the kind of the who you get to meet on these immersions is pretty amazing. I mean, we met, we went to Rovio, um, we met uh, one of the top execs at Spotify in Sweden, in Stockholm, you know, it's really cool who Anderson allows us to have access to and who we can have these really frank and, and um, great conversations with, and you learn an endless amount from having those conversations. And so, uh, truly, was a, a great experience. You see, here's James down there again. <laughs> um, oh, I see lots of yeah. Faces. Oh, and I'm so glad your wife oh, yeah. got to go because that's such a, you know, for those of you, yeah, who are going to come to school here in the future, yeah, you know, the global immersions. Lucy Allard, her team, you know, as soon as we start yeah. to get the green light, we're going to be going again. For your class in the class of 20, they're they're holding alumni seats for people who, you know, didn't get to go those these last four quarters. Oh, be, yeah, awesome. they're gonna try. I mean, you know, we we want people to participate because for some people it really was like that's part of why I chose Anderson. We invented these things, we're good yeah. at them. Um, I'm so glad you got to go beforehand and that your wife got to go with you. Cause that, for those of you listening, that's one of the ways you can say thank you to your husband, your wife, your significant other you know, your sister, your brother, you know, you can bring a, you can bring a life partner. <laughs> um, they don't necessarily yeah. go to all the classes, but they can, you know, they can shop, they can do cultural. Oh. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff they can yeah. do. She loved it. She, you know, especially in Scandinavia, you can bike everywhere. And she, mm -hmm. we would get back from, you know, a day of going to these, these meetings, et cetera. And I, I'd get back to the hotel and she was like, she'd be like, I biked 25 miles throughout Stockholm today. <laughs> like, oh. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, uh, uh, really was uh, a phenomenal experience worth every, every, you know, penny and every, all the time. You know, it was a lot of work, but uh, a great, a great class. And I highly recommend uh, the global immersion. Oh, very good. Was that professor, uh, is that professor Abe? Was that? 
Yes, yes, it, well, it is. It is Abe. It is was just a wonderful professor to have on that trip too. Really, just a great, a great experience all around. Oh, excellent! Oh, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's a he's a yeah. he's an institution within Anderson. He's been around a long time. He's like he knows. He's just built a lot of the the back the infrastructure in the background with the global immersions. He's a real contributing entrepreneurial spirit himself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's uh, phenomenal, super knowledgeable too. I mean, the we had some great conversations with him, and just uh, the knowledge in that man's head is pretty, pretty uh, remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, one other thing um, I would plug that I got involved in my first year is if you are inter interested in entrepreneurship, and even I would I would argue if you're not and you just want to learn more about business and even potentially have that idea down the road is a program called Entrepreneurship Leadership, Entrepreneurial Leadership Development Program, ELDP. Uh, another thing you'll learn in business school is everything has an acronym. There's a trillion everything. acronyms to learn. Oh yeah. Um, but the ELDP is, you, you have to apply, you first you have to be part of Entrepreneur Association and then you have to apply to um, be on an ELDP team basically. Uh, and if you are selected, once you're selected, so if Fembo, you're selected your first year, you're on it throughout your entire tenure at Anderson. So first, second, and third, you have access to this. And what it is, is you get, your team is paired with a mentor and your mentors are often very, very successful entrepreneurs that are outside of Anderson that do this for free. They just do it because they like to do it. And though your group and that mentor it's usually eight to 10 Fridays. So it's a little difficult if you have a full-time job, but Fridays uh, a year, you go to companies or CEOs come to you and you have like very intimate, frank conversations with very successful people across all different types of industry. Um, and then the second half of the day is kind of as the cohort having lunch and really talking about what you learned and what your experience and you know, it even gets to in, in personal challenges and struggles you're having in business or in, in your life that the cohort can really help you with. Uh, and it's been a, an amazing experience and something I cannot tout strongly enough. And say, say the name again, just for people who didn't catch it. It's the Entrepreneurial, it's Entrepreneurial Leadership Development Program, ELDP. And in order to get involved, join Entrepreneur Association. And pretty early on, I want to say by like late September, mid-October, you'll get an email about ELDP. And then that's kind of the path you can go down. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know yeah. about that. I've been here 19 years. Every time I do a podcast, I learn some <laughs> other wonderful, cool little pocket of activity. Uh, they, are, they are endless. Uh, another piece of advice I would give is Anderson doesn't necessarily give you, you know, feed you mouth feed you all of the avail all of the opportunities available to you and so it really is the onus is on the student to kind of go out and network and talk to people and kind of figure out what's out there and go to events uh to kind of create that own path so i would definitely not wait for any inf i mean this is a good life lesson too but don't wait for anything to come to you you really need to go out and and find it um mm -hmm. but it's there i mean it is an, an abundance of riches at anderson uh so highly I recommend kind of going down whatever path you want and really exploring and asking questions. Yeah, my my metaphor to help orient people to, because it's going to be FOMO and that's all right. You know, you're you're paying for FOMO, and I, yeah. I use the I use the Mother's Day since yesterday was Mother's Day. I use the Mother's Day buffet at the Four Seasons or whatever, and it's you know 120 bucks a head, and you take your mom and you know, and you're going to go bankrupt for this meal but there's such a spread and you know if you can't possibly sample everything but you're paying for the the opportunity to even consider the choice group and you yeah. you, you have to be judicious because you know if you eat all the carbs and you can't right like you you you, you want to sample wisely and just appreciate you know I can't, I can't make a meal. These are entire careers, right? The, you know, like yeah. I go to that, like you said, you, you went and sampled a lot of stuff. And, and even if it's not going to be your forever meal, right? Just getting the sampling of it and you take away a card, you take away a contact, 
you're, you're exposed to an element of an idea of what's percolating over here that I can cross reference over there that that's okay, you know, but it, but it does yeah. so much of the value is in the classroom, hundred percent. You're paying for research faculty, tier one, number one research university, public research university in the world, the last four years, you're paying for the in-class education and you're paying for the hallways <laughs> and the happy hours and you oh, know, yeah. all of it. Yeah. Whenever, whenever I had classmates that would be like, like you do so much. My response was always, we are paying a lot to be here. It's like, I'm going to wring this dry. You know, I just take, it's three years. I will be the first one to say there were times I was exhausted. I'm so thankful I had my, I have my wife, you know, I will be honest and say there were a few breakdowns over the last three years of just like, this is, you take on so much and you're just like, I can't, I'm underwater. But looking back on it, it was always worth it because all of those experiences I learned from it, I figured out what I want to do. I had zero idea going into business school. I didn't even know what a management consultant was, never even heard of that. And now I'm going into management consulting. And, you know, the reason I could go down that path was I jumped into, jumped into school and I was like, I'm going to explore every nook and cranny of this. And then once I try something, if I'm, if I'm like, okay, that was cool. I used that was great. I tried it. As you kind of said, I tried the, the cod and I didn't really care for the cod. So I'm not going to try the cod again. Now I'm going to go over to the salmon, you know, and uh, I think your first year, depending on how your life works, your first year, your second year as a FEMBA, one of the joys of being a FEMBA, you're there for three years instead of, instead of two, uh, like the full time. So you can really do that first or second year and then use that third year or that second year to really hone in on what you want, um, which uh, it's really what I did. I kind of went all in first year. Second year was a lot more focused for me. And then third year, I allowed um, things to be a lot kind of calmer for me uh, because I kind of knew the path I wanted to go on. I'd already kind of really attacked school really hard the first two years, which allowed my third year to be a lot more relaxed and really kind of be able to enjoy my final year at Anderson. Granted, it was during a pandemic, which <laughs> there's some, some problems in it, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> Well, well, two things I want to tease out, if if you would be so generous. Um, you know, one is about the you know you did have some breakdowns. There were moments where things you know get overwhelming. Definitely that. I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, not like how how do you get through that and maybe your lessons that could benefit others. That's number one. Number two is to go from not knowing what management consulting is to walking out of the door at BCG. So there are going to be people listening who are like, well, what? Tell me more about that, right? Did you do on-campus recruiting? But yeah. So the first one, you know, like, yeah, because FEMBA, like, I think MBA breakdowns are a unique kind of breakdown because it, you're, it's only a breakdown because you chose to be here, right? All your friends who are still sitting <laughs> at home eating potato chips are not having the problems you're having, but you're having, I mean, yeah. my MBA was stressful. It was not the happiest time of my life. It definitely grew me, right? It was... So like, I'm grateful for it, but if I could ever mitigate other people's pain, I'm happy to mitigate pain because <laughs> some pain was maybe unnecessary because yeah. I didn't, I don't think, I think I was too young and too green and maybe not quite mentally tough enough. I was used to like finding a sweet spot and being a star. And my experience of my yeah. MBA was, I was trying to find a sweet spot <laughs> and I was just average or below in so many things because my peers were so amazing. And I was like, am I, am I the admissions mistake? That's what it would sound like in my brain versus what a killer yeah. opportunity to learn, right? Like if I was older, mm -hmm. I think I would have had more wisdom, but I was young, whatever. So, so, okay. So how did, what's the Ben Robner secret sauce for, you know, when, when life's kind of hitting you with a stick, you know, what, how did you get through those down parts of FEMBA? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Yes, it's funny because it is definitely a chosen stress. And even more so, you know, I had to talk to a career counselor about the fact that I realized, and I think this is a life problem of mine, I I tend to say yes to everything. And when that. you say yes to everything, yeah. <laughs> when you say yes to everything, suddenly everything suffers a little bit. And also being the type of person that I want to put 110% into everything I do and I want to, you know, be the best I possibly can be. And I want everyone that worked with me to like walk away and be like, wow, that was, Ben was really great. When 
that started suffering, that's when I kind of started having these breakdowns of like, I've, take, I've said yes to a million things. I'm not giving, I can't give my all to any of them because I'm exhausted and things are falling apart. And that one, that realization, which I didn't, don't really think I ever really had in life fully, was I think a really big growing uh, growth moment for me. And I had uh, you know some great conversations with the career counselors about kind of how do I learn from this and how do I actually act on that moving forward and not just keep saying yes. Um, and then to kind of talk about how you, how I dealt with it is this is so cliche and I'm going to, when, uh, when it's something that's said at Anderson all the time is growth mindset and mm -hmm. the idea of like growth mindset. Initially I was like, shut up. Like, I don't <laughs> want to hear about growth mindset. Um, but the reality is the reality is, and now my wife gets angry with me because I constantly say growth mindset, uh, because it's true. It's like. What, if it doesn't kill you, you might be completely stressed out. You might be like, I made the worst possible decisions by doing a thousand things. I am a full component about have your breakdown, like allow yourself to be in utter disarray and then pick yourself back up and go, all right, what, what can I learn from this? Do not do this again. Um, and it also kind of goes back to that thing we were talking about earlier about resilience, right? Mm -hmm. It's, not terminal like i'm not going to be taking a million things on it in, in business school for the rest of my life this is a moment in time yes it's extremely stressful i will get through it i will do the best i possibly can do and i will like then kind of do a post-mortem which you know we do in business all the time but i think in life it's really important to do those post-mortems as well of why did i have this breakdown like why why was it so stressful why was it not sustainable? Like something that I talk about my wife with my wife a lot is we have to think about what is sustainable, not like what do we want to just do right now. Um, and that's another thing I really learned in business school is if I'm thinking about not the short term, I'm thinking about the long term. I'm thinking about what do I want to be in two, five, 10, 20, 30 years? How do I sustain to that point? Like how do I sustain through that whole experience? And when I kind of had those breakdowns, that's those moments of like, this isn't sustainable. So in the future, how do I set myself up to ensure that whatever I'm doing that is sustainable? And so I'm avoiding falling apart and being like, I can't do the 10,000 things I said yes to. Yeah. Thank you. You know, yeah, it just, because I, it, it would be easy to look at your, you know, beautiful life and your brand new daughter and, and, you know, your walk out the door outcome and think, oh, well, he must just have better genes than me, <laughs> you know, yep. but, but right, like you're a human being on the court, learning, trying, growing, growth mindset, cliche though it may be, now you can't yeah. not say it to your wife. <laughs> yes, we become quite annoying with our jargon. <laughs> it is hilariously true. Um, my friends make fun of me too for like you, you know, you, you go into business school thinking you're not going to do it. And by the time you exit, you're saying all of the business school jargon, everything's in acronyms. It's, it, I mean, it's hilarious how it happens. It's, uh, it's true. Um, you know, this is a good, a good segue into kind of the consulting yeah. topic. If you want to go into that, please. Um, so I, as I mentioned, had zero. I did never heard of management consulting. Didn't know it was a thing going into business school. Um, going into school, you take this career leader, which is like an assessment of where you would best fit in your career as like a future career. And in no way, shape, or form is it the gospel. Like it's just informative of how this thing views you. And what's funny is when I took it, the very, very top was management consultant. And I called my dad and I was like, Dad. Career leader says uh, I should be a management consultant. It sounds like a pretty cool job. I don't know that much about it. And his response was, you don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, and I was like, why not? And he's like, it's uh, it's like a grind. It's, you know, thankless, all this stuff. And I was like, oh, all right. And I kind of, honestly, I was like, okay, well, I put it on my the back of my mind because I, I a big part of me thought I was going to go to business school and continue down entrepreneurship and just start a new company with classmates or however, like I thought I was just going to continue down the entrepreneurial path. Um, and then my first year uh, in council, as a member council, as a matter of fact, one of the uh, classmates above me, Sean Lee, was pursuing consulting, and he was working closely with me because I was under him as a as a rep. And he talked to me once. He was like, you know, getting to know you, I really do think 
like you should look at consulting. It sounds like something you'd be really interested in. It seems like it fits your personality well. And so I started diving into it and kind of talking to professors about it and looking, doing some research and thought, oh, this does sound kind of up my alley. Um, and really, I got really interested in it. So fast forward to second year, in order to kind of go through the recruiting track, uh, and you, everyone that goes to Anderson will learn this, you have to go into on-campus recruiting and take these separate classes to really understand the process of it all, et cetera. So I did that. Um, and my first year did on-campus recruiting because I thought I might recruit. And then second year to go into consulting, it's like a very, very uh, competitive and uh, difficult um, uh, on-campus on recruiting path. Mm -hmm. And you do like this, these casing and it's, it's a, a whole thing. And I, the summer going into it, I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. I joined uh, one of my good buddies also from council, Dylan, uh, Dylan Devin Co. Um, uh, also was going down that path, Luke as well, uh, who's on council with me. Um, and so we kind of all went down this path together and we're like, we're gonna, we're gonna go for it. And after doing a bunch of research on these firms, I was like, oh, this is everything I want. Like it's uh, a constant challenge. I'm, I can learn about, one of the things I loved about business school is diving into all these different industry I don't know about. You know, I love strategy class and I realized oh, I can make a career out of exploring new industries, learning about things I don't know, and then using that creative side of me to kind of come up with a solution of how to solve it uh, and get paid to do it. Like, that sounds like heaven. Like, let's, let's go for it. Um, and so, you know, I, I jumped into the consulting recruiting path and I got, I did exactly what they tell you not to do. Um, and I got obsessed with uh, Boston Consulting Group. And you're hit over the head with, do not put all your eggs in one basket, like really go out there and, you know, any consulting job's a good job. All the firms are great. Just like go for it. And yes, I talked to a lot of the firms and I did go for it, but I was very gung ho for BCG. And um, I got to second round with BCG, which I was really excited about. And then I didn't get an internship offer. And this harks back, harps back to one of those things of like resilience, right? So mm -hmm. Didn't get an internship offer from BCG. There was one other firm um, that I thought I had an a chance with and didn't get an, off an internship offer from them. And so now I'm entering um, my summer without an internship offer. And that's a pretty hard thing to come back to, back from if you wanna go down the consulting path. And uh, you know, at, we were talking about breakdowns. This period of my MBA, I was doing a million things I was casing all the time. I put a lot of time and energy into it, like an obscene amount because I wanted it and I didn't get it. And that was a pretty hard pill to swallow. Um, but took my time to have a kind of a breakdown and then said, I got to keep going and trying this. Saw so another firm was uh, recruiting still for internships. They're kind of off cycle recruiting for internships, another consulting firm applied, got to second rounds with them the day before my second round, which was in April, got canceled because of the pandemic. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. So now I'm like, well, this is fun. Um, luckily, I joined another group, another um, thing called Anderson Strategy Group, which if anyone's interested in consulting and you have the flexibility, an amazing experience. It's you get eight units for it. It goes over winter quarter and spring quarter. And over spring quarter, you and uh, four of your of uh, mine, they were all full time MBAs myself and uh, what who they call a partner, which is a um, second year MBA, um, you have an actual engagement with a real firm outside of Anderson. So you do a 10 week consulting engagement with an actual firm. And I, I it was a real consulting engagement. I loved it so much. I was like, I have to do this. This is what I have to wow. do. Um, didn't have an internship though, but our client loved us and they wanted us to keep working with us. So we actually, the two full-time, two of the full-time MBAs created their own LLC, and I became basically like the consultant lead, and we did engagements for this client outside of Anderson from June of last year up until February of this year. So we did five engagements. I led all of them, and we just pulled Anderson classmates to be like the consultants, and we everyone got paid. It was great, and so wow, you know, fast fast forward to my third year, I'm going to full-time recruiting and. After I didn't get the second year internship, the BCG recruiter called me and she was like, hey, Ben, I just want to let you know, everyone loves you and we want you to apply full time. It's just a no go. So I emailed her going into full time recruiting and I'm like, hey, I'm still extremely interested in BCG. 
and she just emails back, hey, you know, with the pandemic, don't really know what's going on. You should definitely apply, but we don't know. Yeah. So uh, apply and I don't hear anything. And, you know, it was super bummed, but um, resilience, keep moving forward. You know, a big thing, but, you know, all of those cliches, they're, they're true, but just keep pushing forward. I, I'm a strong believer in it. It'll work out. And then out of the blue, the recruiter emails me and was like, hey, we're finally hiring again. And this was February. We're hiring again. And so this is off cycle too, uh, because of the pandemic things, recruiting cycles were all over the place. But uh, she was like, when we'd like you to interview and end up interviewing, going to second rounds and getting an offer from the firm I had been, you know, obsessively pursuing and quite literally accepted that I wouldn't get. And what's funny when the partner called me, um, I, you know, told me, I, well, I'll be honest and say, I, I shed some tears. Uh, I was very, very happy. Um, and I said to the partner, I was like, I don't think you realize how much I wanted this. And he said to me, he was like, it actually came up in our conversation about you. So I think that the takeaway there is, and this is something I've been saying the first and second years that are going down, this is like, don't be shy about your passion for something, right? Like, People want people that are excited and are passionate and show that. And I was never embarrassed in any conversation to kind of talk about how excited I was about the firm. And I did a lot of research on it, which of course is important. And I think one of the reasons I did end and finally end up getting hired um, is I was never shy about like, this is the firm I want to be at. This is why I want to be at this firm. This is why I'm excited about this firm to everyone I, everyone I could talk to. Um, and you know, it paid off, but all that being said, I fell a lot <laughs> getting there, right? There were a lot of stumbles and a lot of times I could have thrown my hands in the air and been like, I can't do this. Like I, I this isn't for me and I didn't. And you know, now I'm, I'm going to what I, what I would argue is the best consulting firm out there. Um, but, uh, couldn't, couldn't be more thrilled. And I think it's, you know, all of the work and all of the energy I put into business school, this is the kind of the payoff that I was aiming for and I wanted and I, I was able to capture. Um, and no small part to just the amazing support system that Anderson offers you. And from both a education standpoint, but from like a social and learning and leadership standpoint, all of that, you know, culminated to me kind of getting this dream job that uh, I'm utterly thrilled and you know cannot wait to start well that's a cherry on top for sure um you know and thanks for contextualizing it right because it's it's easy to kind of get bamboozled with the cash and prizes um because yeah. you know all schools are going to put their stars on their website and in a place like ucla we have a lot of stars but there's work that went into those stars becoming able to shine it's it you don't just wake up and roll out of bed and get these type of things this is the culmination of you know you could say three years you could say 14 years right it goes back to the conservancy yeah. and oh, making totally. your cuts and you know yeah. job interviewing is like trying out you know it's an audition right do i fit yeah. the role do i fit the part can they envision me in the part and if i'm in the part will i light up the part more than the other people they have to choose from, right? And I just love your, you know, resiliency and, you know, I, I, I respect imposter syndrome. I have my versions of it all the time, but I loved your perspective of, you know, it's like, I'm just, <laughs> that's not for me. I'm not going to go there because all of us at some point, whatever ism we're working through, I heard one the other day, there's baldism, you know, no bald person has been, a, has been elected president since the era of television, right? Not to diminish anybody's pathway or journey, yeah. but he, the human experience is going to put obstacles in our path. If there's something I want to go for and it's worth getting, other people are going to want it also. And why, why would life respond to me, you know, and maybe, yeah. maybe effort, Plus, you know, talent, all that stuff and, and training and education and right place at the right time and who you know. And you got to do the work, right? Some, yeah. some sort of secret sauce out of all of that. And I think your story generously told, you know, I love the cash and prizes. You know, oh my God, your daughter's beautiful. Wow, you know, your wife gets, she gets you 
and some stability different than the serial entrepreneur Hollywood model. Um, you know, our husband's yeah. going to work a lot. You know, your dad's your dad's concern. You know, you're going to be factoring for that. But all these firms, yeah, you work hard. But COVID's also transforming everything. You know, and I mean, management consultants have been reinventing modern work for 40 years anyway, because they are really yeah. the you know, they're the Gandalfs <laughs> of the modern economy, they're walking around, <laughs> you know, looking and seeing, peering behind corners. And, and like you said, your creativity, like walk into a new industry, but then let your creativity engage to see how you could suggest solutions that the incumbents, you know, they're, they're so in the forest, they can't see the trees, right? And you're going to come in yep. with, you know, BCG, you're going to have frameworks and a method and and you're going to, you know, you're not going to just, it's not going to, you're not going to, oh, shucks, I think, you know, you're going to yeah. have a, a path, but it's still going to require that creativity and everything I've heard about how you've lived your life. Like, oh yeah. You know, and then, and even your resiliency and you're ignoring the coaches don't fall in love with one client. I'm doing a little summary here, but there's so many good mm -hmm. things. So I'm, I'm taking the moment to summarize just because if, if yeah. you're new, you know, I want everybody, you know, I want your 2021 friends, you know, to be proud of who they nominated want your, you know, your wife and dad, mom, I want everybody to hear this interview, but specifically, if I could make the world a slightly better place, if, if people who follow in your footsteps can go, oh, okay, he did it, you know, he got dinged and binged and, you know, it wasn't just a linear pathway. Um, and no way, shape or form. Yeah, look what he could control, he could control his resiliency, you know, he, he could control yeah, I'm having my imposter syndrome and that's enough of that. And yeah, I'm having my breakdown, you know, and I'm going to allow myself to have my breakdown. I think that's real healthy psychology you're sharing there. Like dad gum it, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 you know, like you use any more scatological stronger words, but we'll go dad gum it, you know, like <laughs> take, take a, take a FEMBA break, you know, take a night off, you know, Call your college buddy that you can commiserate with, you know, go to the pier, do something stupid, you know, eat too many nachos, whatever, you know, don't go crazy, but like, go ahead and mourn that that future didn't happen, but then get up Sunday morning, dust yourself off. You know, I'm, I'm still, yeah. you're still opportunities abounding here. And that is what I paid for. So, you know, so what now, what, what's next? And I think that's CEO of your own life you know, that's the kind of husband, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's why she, she chose you, right? Because she could see that in you, you know, and like when now you bring little dependents into the world, you know, they're counting on you, you know, and, yeah. you know, I'm, I just want to also acknowledge, you know, your peers said, hey, Ben's got a story worth hearing. And now for me, for the first time getting to hear the deep dive of it, I know exactly what your peers were talking about. Like, yeah, put the spotlight on, on Ben, right? He's a great representative of our unique covid class of 2021 you know 102 years oh, yeah. of ucla we're the only generation that had to do their senior year <laughs> in yeah the pandemic so yeah. yeah yeah so yeah just good That's, on uh, you, I think you summarized thank you for, it nicely thanks for well thank you for sharing it with us um yeah so all right well uh, you know, i will you 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 i'll let me I was just going to say, I, I have to give credit where credit's due because my father, if he listens to this, would want me to say this. You mentioned effort, but my entire life, my dad said, there, there will always be someone smarter than you in the room. You need to be the one that tries harder. Hmm. And so uh, it took a while. It took a while in my life to accept that, especially as a young person. You're like, nah, I'm gonna, no. But it's true. I mean, if you're the person that's going to try the hardest, uh, that person, at least in my mind, will win every time than the, the smartest person in the room. I'm a proponent, right? The stand and deliver thing. You got to raise your hand and say, excuse me, life. May I, may I have, if, if you would be so willing as to give me an interview, I'll, I will bring a plan for your consideration that you might like, you know, it, yeah. you, you do have to see yourself in the role, you, you know, and, and I, I love that from the equity, diversity, inclusion conversation right now. I got to see it to be it. And I, I love that. I think that's, I think it's, I think it's extremely congruent with the equity, diversity, and inclusion conversation, but I also think it's it's a human conversation in all of us, you know, and we, we kind of said as we were warming up today, like, 
there's some drama major in the class of 2024 or 25 or 26 who's going to see this and go, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. And there's somebody who's, you know, got a boyfriend or girlfriend that's, you know, okay, we can, you know, take that next step, right? Life is always, it's these stair steps and we're never quite ready. Oh, yeah. But we, we step anyway. Yeah. You know, it's an act of faith and, 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 we, and we do surround ourselves. You know, you've got, I hear a lot of mentors, right? Another theme in your, you know, you, you let people bring you their best advice. You're still, you know, you're still, it's still Ben's path, but you're not going it alone. You know, you are, you are surrounding yourself yeah. with, with excellent, you know, the career team, your classmates. I love, I love Devin and Sean. Hey, I think you might be a good consultant, right? And you only knew Devin and Sean because you were in FEMBA council and you were really stepping into leadership and, you know, like, so I'm, I really am pulling out these, these memes to make sure, or these, not memes, but these threads of your story, <laughs> you know, these, these, this, the, the fabric of, of Ben Rovner's story you know, because your tapestry is your tapestry, but but those threads, you know, and, and each of the people who choose to listen to this, right? I want to share Ben's success so that you can drive change in your life, right? That's that's what this is about. You know, there's no one way to do Anderson. There's no one way to do life. But I, I do think that Anderson's strength is how entrepreneurial we are. And the challenge of Anderson is how entrepreneurial we are. And you, you, you are benefited if you've got a little intestinal fortitude. Don't let the FOMO, oh, yeah. you know, try for stuff. And, and if you overextend, back off a little bit. If you underextend, get back in the boat. You know, it's, it's that sweet spot management, you know, and I love your, God, you said a lot. I love the theme of, of sustainability and now sustainability in a marriage, now sustainability in a marriage with, oh, I'm going to get off the clip. The you daughter. Know, <laughs> those are grown up. Those are grown up conversations. And when you are CEO of your life, yeah. you know you never want to sacrifice your family life. The goal is not to be CEO and three times divorce. That's not a great goal. Um, but the goal is not to be mm -hmm. married and poor, right? Like there's a there's a sweet spot. And and then kids just spell love T I M E, right? And you're gonna have a lot of pulls on your time oh, yeah. when you're CEO of your life. So. I think what I love about the challenge that I continually witness students at Anderson voluntarily put themselves through is they, you know, they voluntarily sign themselves up for this too much. It's just too much. There aren't enough hours in the day if you're thinking the way you thought before you came to Anderson. So you got to let Anderson, even like you said with the conservancy, you got to let it break you down a little bit because managers, leaders, CEOs, they do think differently. It's a different mindset because it's this is a terminal degree in management. There is no PhD in business. I mean, there is, but that's not, you know, this is the terminal degree to go be a practitioner of the art and science of management. And you, you know, you're yeah. four or five weeks away from that. <laughs> and, and you're going to yeah. get paid to help other people do that. As a, as a consultant with BCG. Yeah. So, all right, back to you, Ben. That's Dylan's little sermon. Always got to be one. <laughs> oh, that was great. You, you really, you like, uh, you, you succinctly encapsulated everything I just said. So it was, it was nice to hear, hear from you kind of what I just said almost. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, it's 530. Oh my gosh. I've got six o'clock soccer and there's I can smell salmon. So we didn't talk about the think tank. We didn't, you were a TA four times. We did talk about your global immersion. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so here's what we're going to do, audience. Uh, so thank you for listening. That was drive time. Hope you enjoyed Ben Robner, hero, amazing representative, class 2021. So now we're going to go do some bonus material. So let's do, let's do the fire. What do you call it? The lightning round. Um, all right. So shout Got out, it. shout out to your class of 2021. You guys are amazing right? You, you had the last four quarters of your nine quarter experience in a remote pandemic reality. So what are you most proud of when you think about your class? What are you most proud of, of your class of 2021? Yeah, I would say what I'm most proud of, of the class of 2021 is our commitment to each other and kind of making the best of 
the situation that we have been dealt. Um, you know, it, it definitely a big part, especially when you have your first seven quarters of school and you're very social and everyone's going out and suddenly that's cut off. The question is kind of how do we, uh, if we go back to like sustainability, like how do we sustain that, right? How do we keep mm. engaging with each other and maintain those relationships? And I think that the class, both from a, you know, the leaders of our class, like Megan Roberts and Hayes and all of the, and James and all of the people that were kind of taking, how can we move this class online to our classmates engaging with that? And also, you know, there are a number of classmates that did things outside of council to just make sure that there were enough opportunities and social online gatherings to not turn business school, not turn the end of our business school just into going to class on screen for three hours and then going away, but maintaining that. And I think there, one, we needed buy-in for that, which I think our class bought in was like, okay, this is the reality and we're going to buy in. But two, we needed creativity. And I think there was just an abundance of creativity that uh, the 2021s put forward and got behind. Uh, and I would say, I'm really proud that that exists. And there were the, the leaders of our class willing to kind of take that huge challenge on uh, and, uh, you know, kind of see success despite the crazy, literally once in a lifetime situation we were all put in. Well said, thank you. Okay, lightning round, um, continuing. Okay, so welcoming the class of 2024. If uh, If you knew then what you know now or what would you say to our, our entering class of 2024? Yeah, so to the entering, entering class of 2024, I would say there are kind of three main things that I wish I had constantly had in my head when I had started. One is it, don't ever be afraid to engage or put yourself out there. I think even though I got there, I was still a little reticent at first. And I think I could have even captured more out of the school. And I think jump into the deep end when you get to Anderson and stay in that deep end until you get out. Um, I would say that's one. Two, I think I do believe that the, the my, my classmates that spent time going to happy hours and going to social events got a lot more out of the school than otherwise. And so even when you're exhausted or you're in Tuesday, Thursday class and class gets out at nine, 30 or 9 40 whenever it gets out and then you go to happy hour and everyone has to get up to work go to work the next morning you just just go i promise it's worth it um i remember during leadership foundations we were like happy happy, happy hours were touted so much and even then i was like all right are they really like that important and i would say they are like a lot of my the cohort that i leaned on even like my bco team a lot of those conversations happened over a beer and they wouldn't have happened if I didn't go to happy hour, even though I was exhausted. Uh, and so I kind of going for the going for those bonds and um, and you know creating those moments. And the last thing is capitalize on the faculty. We have mm -hmm. phenomenal professors at Anderson, and I had, was never shy about going and grabbing lunch with them or emailing them with questions or get, getting having phone calls with professors that I really looked up to or I thought had really interesting perspectives. And now I have mentors that I really believe, not not even believe, I know I can reach out to after Anderson um, that have helped me even, you know, in, in questions or problems I was having while in school, I've reached out to them. And they, some of them literally will call me on the phone and be like, let's talk through this. And part of that is just my willingness to engage with my professors in class and outside of class. And there are some just unbelievably accomplished, brilliant people that are here to teach us. And I, you know, take advantage of that, mm -hmm. uh, I would say. So engage, happy hours with your happy hours, social time with your classmates, and really make sure you capitalize on the relationships you can create with your professors. Awesome. Thank you. One of our dear colleagues, Terry Zabo, your class manager, class of 21, um, is retiring after a long career. So any, um, what would you wish for Terry as she starts the next chapter of her life. What what words could you share to our, our dear colleague, Terry Zabo? Yes, Terry, first, congratulations. That's phenomenal. And uh, so excited for you. 
Um, thank you for all of the support throughout these three years. You were extremely valuable to myself, valuable to myself and the rest of my classmates. Uh, for to wish, you know, take some time, have go to the south of France and drink some wine. Uh, you know, really just fully embrace the, the whatever whatever road you're going down. You've you know, worked very hard at UCLA for a long time, and uh, you've earned it. You're a phenomenal person, and I, you know, I'm excited for you. I I hope to, uh, you know, in many years, also be in the south of France drinking nice bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Ben. I've, Terry's been here since I've, she was here before I got here. So I've never known UCLA without Terry. We're going to miss you, Terry. Okay, Crazy. three more, three more in the lightning round. Um, let's see, what are you looking forward to? You know, COVID's going to end. So what are you most looking forward to post COVID? Oh my God, just, I'm a very social person. So like being around people, it's been very difficult. My wife's been pregnant for a large part, portion of it. So we've been very, very cautious. Uh, and my wife and I are also big foodies. We love to go to nice restaurants. We love to eat out. We love being around people, all of that. I mean, just like humans, uh, it, it's like these, it's just human beings around me uh, is what I'm looking forward to most. Um, on like a more specific it would be honestly like just going to nice restaurants and sitting inside or sit. We love to sit at bars and talk to bartenders. Like we love to do that. Can't do any of that. Um, so that like the human interaction that we've been missing is what I'm craving. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I'm hoping we can get a couple thousand. Well, get a five or 700 of us at the Rose Bowl. That's my, so um, I'll be there. And then, and then, but now here's one, the other side of the coin, right? Because we are reinventing, we're reinventing the future of education and work oh, yeah. and everything. So what part of COVID has been worth keeping? You know, what do you want to bring forward from this chapter we've all just lived through? Yeah, there are two things. On a kind of work side of things, um, the realization that we don't need to like working from home is a very possible thing. I, I think that option is something that businesses are already embracing and will embrace. Um, you know, there's a, a balance there because sometimes working from home can end up taking more of your time away because you're always where you're supposed to be. Like you don't have that divorce between work and home. It kind of marries. So I think balancing that is going to be really important in the future. But the, the realization of like, you and I are, just have had a great conversation. We're looking at each other and I didn't have to, you know, drive to UCLA to do it. Uh, so I think that the other thing I would say on kind of a more personal side is I, as has been a running theme, I'm a very, I like to do things. I like to go, I'm like, go, go, go. You know, my wife's the same way. And the pandemic has kind of forced us to stay, right? To like be inside and figure out how do, how do we create calmness and like, how do we just take a breather and accept, you know, be at home. And especially now that we have a daughter, like that's gonna be very important. And that is very counterintuitive to how she and I both operate. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic has forced us to kind of go in that direction. And I think it's something that she and I've talked about and it's very important to both of us to hold on to that is we don't always have to go somewhere or go out or, you know, be those social people we are. It's also important to kind of take time to yourself and with your family and stay at home and, uh, you know, read a book. Like just don't, you know, like sit in your backyard and read a book, like take those moments that were forced upon us and put them into our everyday lives when we aren't being forced to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> Isla may, Isla may be just a, a very zen, she may just be very serene, you know, it may be we'll one see. of the she had this, she had this yeah. kind of chill pregnancy. She's like hanging out. Everybody, yeah. these two adults are very calm. She may not know exactly that. Not normally. Normally they're not so calm. They're going, going, going. A uh, quick hilarious story. My wife and I, we, so we moved to a house um, back in January. But before that, we lived in like a small townhouse in Culver City. And we had a second story, pretty big deck. And by June of the pandemic, we were like, we can't go anywhere. We don't have a pool. And so we bought a large kiddie pool and put it on the deck and filled it with hose water and we just hang out in our kiddie pool. It was great. It was hilarious. Oh, 
I live in Culver City. That's Culver City living right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fine, fine, Culver living. Beverly Hills, adjacent, adjacent. Oh, I love it. That's great. That's great. Okay, I was wrong. There's two more in lightning round. Okay, next to the last question. So, you know, five weeks from graduation, how do you evaluate, you know, people always want to know, how do you evaluate the return on investment of your MBA? So from where you sit right now, how do you evaluate this investment you made in yourself? Uh, I mean, I could do, uh, you know, an NPV analysis and we could, we could really talk through the whole thing, which is what, you know, now, now that I know it, I didn't even know what NPV was going into business school. Um, but uh, I, you know, you can, I can evaluate it on the kind of career side where I'm now going down a career path that will, BCG will offer, open a million doors to me, or I'll stay at BCG for a long time. And I didn't, there, with, I, there's no way I would have ended up at BCG if I didn't go to business school. Like that is just not a thing that would have happened. I wouldn't even probably gotten into consulting. So from just like a career shifting point of view and going down a new career path that I'm extremely excited about, that alone, you know, is worth it. If I just, if everything else goes away, that I would say is worth the money I put forward. That being said, what I, and I, this is going to sound cheesy, but I really believe the relationships I have developed and I have um, created at Anderson are the, the, the best return I've gotten. I mean, the network I now have for the rest of my life of people that I can lean on in bad times and people that I can help support when they're bad times and people that we can all celebrate our good times together will be there. And you know, in business, as we mentioned earlier, business, it's, it's human. We're all humans. And having those relationships and people across all industry, across the entire country and some aspects across the world that we, once you become an Anderson MBA and an alum, you have that. And that is, I mean, it's invaluable, right? I can put a value on my career if we talk about total compensation, et cetera. But the, the network that Anderson has allowed me to have um, is invaluable. And then also just the amount of knowledge and growth I've done. I mean, it's insane, the, the kind of what's happened in three years. And as I said earlier, the only thing I wish is that I had done this, you know, two or three years earlier. Any more than that, I probably wasn't ready. Um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it, I could not say enough how like beyond thrilled I am that that I ended up at Anderson. Excellent. All right, I'm getting the high sign because we got to. I, I see. I, yeah. My 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 third got grade. Was, he's, in, yeah, he's, in, he's in CCFC Culver City Football Club. So oh, yeah. six o'clock practice. Okay. Uh, last one. Productivity hack. Favorite productivity hack. Personal professional what's what's something that's working for you these days yeah man i mean more than anything i put i think this is pretty common but i my calendar i put everything i put reminders every single thing i possibly anything i have to do in count assignments everything i need is in my calendar at the beginning of every day i can just look at my calendar and know what i have to do um additionally uh additionally productivity hack is i used to have the messiest desktop in the world. It was just like everything was on my desktop. It's just files. I now I'm very diligent about how I file everything on my computer. And that has helped me a lot. Um, and I think, I mean, honestly, those are two things I was not, I did not do very well before business school and business school forced upon me more than anything on my calendar. It's just become, I know this is like common and probably not something that a lot of people don't know about, but my calendar has become the most important thing to me to ensure that I hit deadlines and maintain and also like have goals, right? If I, if I put like, this is going to get done by then, I have a specific place I can see and make sure it's done by that time. Well, you know, there are a lot of things that you just can't get enough of in life. And, and Ben Rovner is definitely one. So, so here we are. These are bonus lightning round questions. We are two weeks to the day beyond our original uh, record date, but we have a couple more questions and Ben has graciously come back. So, so how are, how's, how's Isla? Isla's doing very well. Um, she uh, finally, we got a little more sleep last night. So I'm usually around four to five hours a night, but last night I got just over six. So I feel like I can take on the world right now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. Very good. So she's, yes, she's what, 19 three, days? Yeah, three weeks. A little over three weeks old. Over three uh, weeks. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. 
but she's on for she's gaining weight she's eating a lot so all all good things um we have a lot of clothes a lot of you know family and friends every day i feel like there's an amazon box of new clothes my brother actually sent a graphic tee for her my brother's name is teddy and he sent a graphic tee that says cool like uncle teddy with sunglasses on it and so we put her in the other day it's pretty great Oh, she's getting her California wardrobe. Oh, <laughs> she's going to be styling on the beach this summer. Oh, yeah. Strolling the boardwalk. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, um, well, I'm so happy you guys are, are, are doing well and that you, again, carved out even some more extra time. So these are, these are five more lightning round questions that evolved after the first week when I originally got to interview you and also Maxine. So are you ready? Let's do it. All right. So this one is, this was a highly technical. You may need to get out your calculator, run a regression. All right. Harry Potter, Harry Potter, any character, male or female, good or bad, who would you be and why? Oh man, Harry Potter. So uh, would be definitely, I think I'm a Gryffindor. Um, so any character with, I mean, this is going to, I like to believe that I'm the hero of stories. So I would Very have good. to say Harry. <laughs> All right. Hey, we've gotten Harry, we've gotten Hermione, uh, we've gotten Hagrid. We it's and and I think Luna Lovegood. So it's there we're okay. We're getting, you know, we're getting a diaspora representation. So okay, you yeah. like Harry, you want to be the hero? Any anything else about Harry and you know, yeah, you know, I would I would say that one of the things that I relate to is he tends to be willing to stretch or break the rules if it's for the greater good. Um, and that is definitely something that I relate to. And when I was younger, it would get me into trouble uh, quite frequently, which I know Harry gets into trouble due to that fact uh, quite a bit. Um, and he's also exceptionally loyal. It's something that I, I really mm. believe um, in. And I think something that's very important to me um, to both surround myself by people that are loyal and also be as loyal as I possibly can be to those that are close to me. And I think that that is very true for Harry. And I also think that there is a part of me that could go Slytherin. And I know Harry, you know, he has that, uh, the, the sorting hat was thinking of putting him in Slytherin and went Gryffindor and said, cause that's what he wanted. And um, I definitely think that that kind of uh, Slytherin mentality of kind of, we're going to get it done and, being slightly opportunistic, I can also relate to um, in some aspects, uh, but it's of course a balancing act. And with maturity, you realize there are more important things in life than to solely be opportunistic. <laughs> so, well, you know, Slytherin, yeah, Sly Slytherin, you know, yeah, it's a house, you know, yeah. many, many good wizards came from Slytherin, but yeah, they, they, they do ambition well, but you know, you had your years being entrepreneurial and, you know, you got to hustle yeah. in LA. So Little Slytherin might be not a bad thing. No, I definitely, you know, that quality, I think, um, is important as long as you, as I mentioned, you can balance it well and you understand kind of what is more important in life than getting ahead is what I mentioned, loyalty and the people around you, et cetera. But you do need that kind of ambition, um, I believe, to really kind of you know, be an entrepreneur. Well, in the world of loyalty and friendship, two weeks later now, I've had, I've almost interviewed all of the summer spotlight. I'll interview James tomorrow, but okay. it's amazing how you got referenced by basically every other spotlight nominee. So <laughs> again, I'm impressed with your class of 2021. You guys are tight and it's great. And it shows. Yeah. That's, they're a phenomenal group of people that I am honored to be a part of. Follow-up question. This one's more at the level of section. You were section four, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so section four, which house? Gryffindor, Slytherin, or you know, Hufflepuff or Raven, you know, Raven's Claw. Yeah, let's see. Section what do you think? Four. Yes. I'm trying to, I mean, I'm trying to think if I put the whole section together. Um I would lean toward Ravenclaw for my section, I think. Um, like a mix of Ravenclaw and Gryffindor. I mean I my section I felt was very um, uh, studious. And uh, I think there was also a lot of, um, I think we were very good at being engaged and um, really uh, one of the reasons I loved my section was kind of the engagement that my class was willing to uh, take part in. Um, but 
I also think there will, you know, we did have a number of stronger personalities, which I think goes along with Gryffindor as well. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag there for my section. Um, I definitely wouldn't say Slytherin, I don't think, for my section. And I would not, like, there are definitely some couple points in this section as well. Uh, <laughs> nice. This is interesting. This is like, I have never thought about this. This is like a whole new way of thinking about about my MBA experience that is, <laughs> is really uncovering some thoughts here. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a consulting interview, you know? Uh, why are manhole covers round? You know, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I like it. Great answer. Okay, uh, last three of the of the additional lightning round questions. So you know, I got my two little mascots up here and, and I owe these questions to my actual biological brother, my brother, John. Um, you know, if you could give a Bruin bear hug, like, right? okay, so you're going to get to give three. So uh, a faculty, staff, ed, administrative person, who would you give a Bruin bear hug to and why? Um, okay, if I could give a Bruin bear hug, I only get one. You can have more than one. It's your, okay, this is your interview. Um, okay, great. I'm going to have a few Bruin bear hugs, but I have explanations for all of them. Um, for... Uh, one of the professors that I really, really um, admire and um, helped me out and really became a mentor for me is Professor Terry Kramer. You know, mm. you hear endlessly about him. And then after I took his class, um, I reached out to him and we've had a number of calls and he's really helped um, me navigate even kind of the you know, consulting road. Uh, and every time I've had a question for him, um, reached out to him but by via email he got back to me within often within the hour one time he called me he had just gotten off a plane ride from flying from LA to New York was in the airport and called me and was like I'm sorry I couldn't call you earlier and I was like you're an amazing human being and he's just so brilliant but also compassionate and cares for his students so much that uh, it really um, you know goes to show kind of how much um, a committed and uh, compassionate professor can kind of be the influence they can have on their students, and I would give him a million uh, Bruin bear hugs. Um, additionally, I would have to give uh, Jackie McNulty of Career Services one. Um, she helped me a lot. The, the, all the Career Services, um, Pam, Jackie, and uh, Susan were all really great, but Jackie and I spent a long time on behaviorals and kind of talking through um, how I would approach interviews for consulting. Um, and not only is she just a really brilliant and, and kind woman, she was extremely helpful uh, and supportive. So I would 100% give her one. And I have one more to give out, and that would be Dean Fracious. Um, you know, you know him well. He is just a truly magnificent human being. Uh, every interaction I've had with him has been. Um, not only easy, I mean, he's just like such an easy person to talk to, but you can tell how much he genuinely cares about all of the students at the school. And yeah, he's just fun and just very giving and um, a phenomenal dean. So I would I would definitely give him a hug as well. And wow. you, Dylan, I'd, I'd give you a hug too, Dylan. Oh, well, <laughs> hey, hey, I'll take it. I will take it. Oh, those are excellent. Professor Kramer and, and Jackie and the whole career team and, and Gonzalo. Excellent. Thank yep. you, Ben. All right. Um, so the there's three F's. So faculty and then friend. So if you were to give a friend a bear hug in the program or you know, pre pre FEMBA friend, who would you give a bear hug and why? Oh man. Um okay, well, I don't know if we're going family, but I have to give my wife one. Well, well okay, yeah, no, no, that's okay. coming. That's coming. <laughs> family's family's the third right, F. We'll go back. Okay, we'll, we'll go back. We'll go back. Um, but but, okay. but that was well spoken. You're gonna be married a long, happy time well done um yeah so i'll go i'm going to break the rules again and i'm going to go outside of um school and then inside school so outside of school uh the hug i'd have to give is one of my best friends in the world uh kind of john hand uh he and i were um you know almost in step we were basically inseparable up until i met my wife and then she kind of took me a little bit from him to yeah, start dividing kind of like home um but he uh really was supportive of the, over the whole, for me applying to being in business school. And um, we always joke about the fact that I just see him a lot less now and the business school took him from me, but um, still has just been phenomenally supportive throughout the whole process. And 
is just a wonderful human being. Um, so I'd give him a hug. Uh, and then in school, I'd have to say my good buddy um, and has been on almost all of my teams, Matt Long. Um, Matt uh, is not only wonderfully kind and fun and a great person to be around, but he is like the perfect complement to all of the all of my shortcomings in business. Um, he complements those perfectly and supports kind of where I need support. And we, I really believe when we work together, we can kind of bring each other up. And he is also the most reliable human being that I may have ever met. So I would, I would give him a big old bear hug as well. Oh, that's, that's kind. And I love that you, you observe, you know, a pre FEMBA friendship, um, because that, you know, that's important also, right? The people who got us here, we don't lose them. You know, it's not, it's not a sacrifice. It's an addition because yeah. we get to add people like Matt. Yeah. Megan's got a funny story about when she moved apartments and Matt sends her a five pound bag of <laughs> gummy bears or gummy worms or something. Yeah. Uh, so he's getting a lot of love on these spotlights. I'm Matt? not surprised. He's a, uh, he's a really caring, great, great person. And, uh, you know, I, and joy and honor that I got to meet him and be friends with him throughout the Excellent. All right. Well, you kind of anticipated because you are a wise and savvy husband who will live a long and happy marriage. So um, uh, your 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 final Bruin bear hug is to a family member you would like to acknowledge. Yes, my final Bruin bear hug, easily um, without any thought, is to my wife. Uh, you know, going through this program is not easy. Um, it takes a lot of time and uh, energy, and, and it's very stressful. And uh, not only has my wife been there the whole time, but she's been endlessly supportive um, throughout the entire experience. Um, and, you know, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, she is getting her PhD um, simultaneously. So we're kind of going through this, you know, next step together, even though her step's a little higher than my step. <laughs> um, but uh, I truly really don't know if I could, I mean, we talked about earlier, you know, the, the difficult times throughout the throughout the roller coaster that is um, Femba, and without her there and kind of to be my support and uh, give me, you know, carry the weight when I feel like I, it's, I'm having a hard time carrying it. Uh, don't know if I could have done it with her. Um, I am endlessly thankful, and I would give her an endless, the biggest possible bear hug I ever could, with uh, of course a few kisses thrown in. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And your wife's name is Melissa. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Got to remember from two weeks ago, my small brain. I can't remember all the wonderful people I get to meet. Well, <laughs> thank you, Melissa. I know she was listening in the background last time. And I mean, what a cool UCLA double career love story, family explosion with in, it's a PhD in architecture, right? Or architecture yep. yeah. history. Yeah. Architecture history is uh is technically what she's doing. Her focus is actually in Los Angeles. So if you need to know anything about LA, she is uh, the, the one to talk to. Oh, well, we appreciate Melissa for all of the, you know, all of the quick meals because you have to go study and just all the negotiation and scheduling and, and, um, and what, a, what just what an amazing thing. I, I just to echo back to your earlier comments about you know, you'd been an entrepreneur for seven plus years and you were making a living in LA successfully in the acting slash, you know, <laughs> event rental management production space, yep. you know, living the hard, scrappy hustle LA life. And you did you want did to want provide, provide a more stable, you know, kind of partnership, you know, your contribution and you, you've created that. I, I just love that you could go from not knowing what management consulting is, <laughs> right, to landing a plum gig. and. Um, I appreciate the the pickup questions. I love the hug. Obviously, I, I'm in love with the hug idea. Harry Potter's for fun. But, um, you know, for anybody who listened all the way to the end of this uh, bonus extended episode with Ben, right? Like, you know, we're not just bragging about Ben, but we're totally bragging about Ben. He was nominated by his classmates that, hey, here's a story the world should know more about. And what I hear in your story is servant leadership and partnership and we're in this together. And, you know, how could we get through this amazing, uniquely challenging time that, you know, the five quarters of COVID impacted education that your class of 2021 went through. And yet 
you know, you're really great friends and people are creating really big outcomes. So um, for everybody who's been listening to Ben all the way to the finish line here, I hope that his story inspires you as you write your story. So, Amen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just, <laughs> you did it right, Ben. And, you know, and it's, it's well, you know, I studied in Mexico, you know, they, they've got this phrase in Spanish. Um, let me see if I always get it backwards, but um, I work to live. I don't live to work, right? Career success yeah. is super important. <laughs> Megan's got a funny thing. She says, well, I am here to get some new shoes. <laughs> 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 you know, like, let, let's not forget that, you know, this is a degree of business, right? There's, there's a practical outcome. And, oh, yeah. you know, and, you know, and, and there's loans and it's expensive, but we have careers to make a difference for other human beings. And we're compensated as we, as we raise our education, raise our competence and are able to go out there and make a big difference. Well, we get paid well, that's okay. Um, but it's also in service of the people that we love. And, you know, so, you know, Melissa, Isla, and, and however big your family will grow to be, um, you know, all of, all of this good on you, Ben. And thank you so much for, for sharing your story because it's a great one. And, and it's been fun for me to hear it two weeks ago. And now this little bit of bonus. <laughs> it's been, uh, it's been my pleasure, Dylan. And, you know, it's always a joy to talk to you. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, honestly, anyone listening, if they want to reach out, please do not hesitate to, I'm always willing to, to chat with potential future, um, you know, UCLA Anderson students or anyone else, uh, but it's, it's been a real pleasure and it's crazy that it's almost over and on to the next chapter, but um, uh, thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. You're going to go out there and make UCLA proud and that's awesome. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. We appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying this 2021 summer spotlight. All six of these wonderful people were nominated by their classmates uh, who said, Hey, there are a lot of great stories in the class of 2021. We didn't get to Matt. We didn't get to Richie Chang. There are a lot of other great people. So these are only six exemplars. It's not everybody. It was a wonderful class. They, they stepped into the goofy, unique life moment of COVID and they didn't miss a beat. And I just hope you're enjoying these and I hope for our entering students and for students in the future, I hope these stories help you write the best story for your career. So thanks, Ben. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.